Michael, you're author of uh, the, the book The Bloodied Field, which tells the story of Bloody Sunday. Can you tell me, uh, you know, what prompted you to write the book, first of all? Well, I suppose the start of The Bloodied Field was probably 13 years ago in 2007. Uh, I was here working for the Sunday Times, we were covering the Ireland-England rugby game and there was so much coverage that time about Bloody Sunday and the fact that there was an English rugby team coming to Croke Park and with, with all the history uh, of Bloody Sunday that was here and, 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 and the discussions around that for years before. Um, there was a lot of coverage then obviously about Bloody Sunday coming up to the game and I just noticed that a lot of it was a bit contradictory or there was bits missing basically. So it kind of was stuck in my mind for a few years that it would be something to go and look at. So eventually started it in 2011 trying to put, put the pieces together and it was a, it was a three year process putting the book, the, the first edition came out in 2014 and you know even in the six years since um, more families have come forward, just, there's just more sources of information have become available so we were able to do an updated edition uh, that came out this year. Um, so you know you know, I always say history is an evolving thing. Even a story that happened 100 years ago, it doesn't stay in the same place as it was 100 years ago. It changes all the time, depending on how much information you can get to. So it's the same, it's the same with Bloody Sunday in Crow Park in 1920. Um, the more information that we can access, the more we can learn about the people, the circumstances, the thinking behind what happened here. And just, it just leads to a greater understanding of the, of the whole day and, and, and why such a massacre happened. I think when I was starting out the project, it really was about filling in the gaps. I mean, even things like the names of the victims were, were sort of muddled down through the years. So it was that basic to start with. But as I got into it and you came across like, you know, for example, Jerome O'Leary, you know, who was 10 years of age. He died while he was sitting on the canal wall watching the game he was shot. Um, I came across a picture of him in a newspaper in England and you're just looking at this child's face and suddenly you, it's not that you so much you make a connection, but you realise that these you know, we don't we know nothing about these people. And to put a face it's like anything, when you put a face to a name, suddenly they become real. So as the process was going along, it more and more came about who are these people? And the deeper I went into it, the more I realised that to understand the legacy and the meaning of Bloody Sunday, you really needed to know who the victims were, where they came from. And I mean they came from across the board. I mean they came from all over the country. They were rich, poor men, women, children no more it's the thing that links 100 years ago to now if you like in terms of the GA the, 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 the broad church of people that come to Croke Park to see a game now it was the same 100 years ago you had people from all over Ireland actually came up to watch Dublin Tipperary that particular day and that's reflected that's reflected in the people who died it's, it's not easy to sum up the events that happened here in Bloody Sunday almost 100 years ago now but for people who maybe aren't aware of what happened can you just describe generally what, 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 how the events of the day um, unfolded well, on the morning, it began with attacks across the city by Michael Collins' IRA squad on alleged spies and agents. It was an attempt by the IRA to sort of counterpunch because the British intelligence system was starting to push in on the IRA. So that's where it began in the morning. Uh, in the end, 14 people were killed also, actually, in the morning. Um, the coming to Croke Park initially was a search operation. The idea was that the police would come here, stop a game between Dublin and Tipperary, a challenge football game, which was a rare thing at the time because a lot of Gaelic games had pretty much stopped. And Dublin and Tip would have been two big teams, two prominent contenders for an all Ireland football title at that time. So it drew a big crowd. The idea was that the police would come here, stop the game and search everybody in the crowd. But the reality of what happened was trucks arrived up on the canal bridge outside and before the police were formed into lines and, and ordered in a proper way to go in and perform a search, some of the police started running down what would have been uh, a pathway down from the canal end here out onto the field over turnstiles and some others took positions on the canal bridge and started firing into the ground. The result was that you had people running for their lives up towards the Hill 16 corner there mainly. Um, so people were shot, trampled, crushed, uh, 14 people died in the end of it, uh, hundreds injured and the whole episode I suppose left a mark on the GA, it left a mark obviously on the families who lost loved ones but it, it left a mark on Irish life and Irish history as well. Um, it was just it was just another push forward towards what eventually would become independence for Ireland but in terms of the GA and in terms of the families involved it, it was a harrowing and uh, um, almost unimaginably, unimaginably traumatic day for the reason that even now, when you come to Crow Park, you don't expect anything other than to have a nice time. People would have come to Crow Park looking forward to seeing a game. They would have been looking forward to a nice day out with their friends and their family. Exact same as what happens now when we come to Crow Park to watch a game. So it's almost unthinkable and almost unimaginable 
that what actually happened on the 21st of November 1920 was that you had a place that went from a place of enjoyment, it just turned into a place of absolute horror for 90 seconds. Uh, Michael, you mentioned uh, the Bloody Field podcast, uh, which you'll be hosting. For people who really enjoyed your book, what can they expect from the podcast? For people who enjoyed the book, I suppose it's, 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 it's another dive into that world. Um, we've taken the book as the basis and kind of moved stuff around a lot. Um, we've Obviously, there's been a lot of new information as well has come up in the last five or six years, so we've been able to push that into it as well. Uh, really, I suppose it's, 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 it's a re-exploration again of Bloody Sunday, what, ha- what exactly happened here and the meaning going forward afterwards. And again, introducing the victims, the families. And I think one of the big things that we've been able to go into that maybe we couldn't, uh, that I wasn't able to go into in the first edition of the book uh, is the impact on the families after Bloody Sunday. Um, it wasn't just a case of burying their loved ones and moving on. This, is, this was an event that stayed with families and stayed with people all the days of their lives and up through the generations. And you can see in their stories where, where that impact seeps out. And I suppose from the very beginning of this whole project, the whole idea has been to try to get this story out to as many people as possible. So there obviously is a cohort of people who will read the book and hopefully they'll get a lot out of it. There's also another cohort of people who might be more inclined to go listen to a podcast or a radio documentary or something like that. So we thought it would be a good idea to take the book as the basis for a podcast and just deliver something that would basically tell the story in as broad a way as possible, taking as many angles as we can. Everything from Mick Hogan, the player, for example, tip the... The, the British who were here in Ireland at the time, the guys who came to Crow Park, how obviously how the shootings happened in the aftermath and so on, and the impact, most importantly, I suppose, the impact on the family. And, and to get to know more about the victims themselves, I suppose that was the big, that was a big motivation for the book at the time, was the fact that we didn't know a lot about the victims. Um, so the podcast, I suppose, is another way of really getting their story out there for people to engage with and to get to know them. I suppose it's a testament to, to the power of the book, uh, to the extent that I mean, you, you have maintained relationships with the families of the victims and you've been hugely involved in projects such as the Grave uh, Restoration Project, which has been very well received. The, the great thing, I suppose, coming off of the Bloodied Field book, I suppose, has been the, 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 the possibility of connecting with the families and learning even more about these people. And as well as that, I suppose, in 2015, eight out of the 14 graves of the the victims here in Crow Park were unmarked. Um, so in, at the end of 2015, the Boyle family first put one up for Jane Boyle. And from then on then, you had the GA Bloody Sunday Graves project kind of came into being. And that in itself was another sort of step forward in terms of understanding who these people were, linking back to the families again after 100 years where really there had been no connection between the GA and the families. Um, and I, I, I think the Graves project has been amazing in so many ways. I think it's been... I've been, to, I've been to the unveilings and you can see it in the families, the emotional reaction of the families um, can be extraordinary. I think for the GA itself, it's been a way almost of processing a grief that was sort of put aside for a long, long time. They didn't really engage with Bloody Sunday in its totality, but I think the Grave Project has allowed us to open it up, look again at what Bloody Sunday meant to the GA itself as well, um, and, and to the families then. I mean, a lot of them, you know, they wouldn't have known the victims, but they would have known an, an uncle or an aunt or a, a grandparent who would have talked all the time about the person who was killed in Crow Park. And for them to have that kind of closure, to have a gravestone put up, it means it means the world to them. It's usually important that we remember the event, isn't it? Because I suppose it's it's part of the GA's fabric in so many ways. We're here at the Hogan Stand, but uh, do you think there's other ways, I suppose, it's affected the GA subconscious over, over the years? I think the impact on the GA has been very has been very subtle because I mean in 1920 they they really didn't talk about it it wasn't mentioned the connection with the families kind of drifted apart it just drifted away they had commemorative games here for years between Dublin and Tipperary and obviously the naming of the Hogan stand was a direct reference to Bloody Sunday but I think the fact that we can reopen the story now we can really look at how it did impact on the GA and I, and I do think that there was a certain form of grieving almost that the GA didn't go through at the time. It's what we, in the 21st century, I suppose, we'd nearly call it post-traumatic stress disorder. They just, they just buried it away. But things like the Bloody Sunday Grave Projects and the erecting of the gravestones and the connections with the families and the reconnecting with some families who had drifted from the GA because of what had happened at Crow Park and because of the fact that there wasn't any contact, all of those kind of things are cathartic, I think, both for the organisation 
and for the people involved as well, for the families involved. It's a two-way street. Um, and I think for the GA, I mean, when, you, when you're here, I mean, I find it, and obviously maybe I'm different because I've been looking at this thing for a long, long time, but I mean, you can feel the energy in Crow Park. I mean, there is an energy in Crow Park anyway for everything that goes on here between games and the history of the place. But Bloody Sunday is in there. It's not like, it's, it's not a conscious thing, but it's there. And I think when you stand, particularly on a day like this when it's here and it's quiet and there's no one around and you start to look around and like, you know where people would have fallen, you know that the police would have come in from that side and, you know, the stands and everything can, can melt away and you can actually feel, get, get some sense of what it might have been like a hundred years ago. I mean, stadiums carry memories. So this stadium will, will always carry the memory of, Crow Park, of Bloody Sunday in 1920 as well.